Good evening, everyone. I am Senator Melanie Griffith, and I am so excited to be here for this installation of our Let's Talk series. I first want to just acknowledge and thank the incredible team that helps put it all together. Uh, Letitia Beal, Karen White, Sherma Brousseau, Najee Bailey. This idea was born uh, over the summer. We wanted to be able to communicate valuable information to the constituents in District 25. And then we decided why limit it there? We want to share information with all who might benefit from it. And so we started a virtual series called Let's Talk. Our first session dealt with wills, estates, and funerals, and was just highly valuable uh, for those who were able to participate. Our second session, we talked about healthy eating on a budget. Our third session, we talked about long-term care resources. We were hearing from so many who are providing care for loved ones and wanted to provide those resources. And I'll let you in on a little secret. Our virtual audience is a small percentage of those who uh, appreciate and value the resources that are provided through this program. At the conclusion of this program, our team will provide a summary of the information provided by our expert pre presenters, and we will send it out in written form to all of those on our mailing list. And we also have a YouTube channel. So those who would prefer to receive their information in the format that it's presented this evening will have an opportunity to view it at another time. The call I just received while we were getting ready to start the Zoom was from, from someone who's been a part of the Let's Talk program and said, I can't be there tonight, but is this gonna be on the, the YouTube channel? And I said, yes, give us a couple of days and we'll have it uploaded. Uh, so we are recording this program and it will be available in YouTube, hopefully within the next couple of days. We are so excited to have tonight an important topic that has been brought to our attention again and again by constituents and by each other. That topic is how to avoid cyber scams. You know, most of us have found ourselves in these days and times using our, our uh, techn technology more and more and being more dependent on technology. And there are those who would prey on some of us who aren't as sophisticated as we would like to be. And even some of us who are sophisticated um, have fallen victim to cyber scams. And so we have a panel of three expert presenters tonight. Our format's gonna be a little different than our previous Let's Talk series. What we're going to do this evening is I'm going to introduce our three panelists. We'll let them each have a minute or two to give us some opening remarks about what they do so that um, we can hear from them in their own words. And then we have a series of questions that have been submitted to us um, from a number of audience and, uh, audiences and some of you who are on this Zoom. And so um, a few of us on the team are going to raise these questions for our panelists and hopefully one of the three of them will, will jump in and respond. And again, we'll open up for, um, for those of you that are present this evening. Uh, if we have time this evening, we will open up for live questions from our audience. But let me just say that um, uh, because our presenters aren't prepared for your questions, we are going to offer them the opportunity if they don't have the answer right at their fingertips to help us research it. And then we can include it in that written feedback that we send out to all of you. So with that, I'm going to thank you all so much for coming and we'll get started. We're joined this evening by Ms. Wanda Gibson, who joined Prince George's County on October 8th in 2019 as the Chief Information Officer, uh, Chief, the Director for the Office of Information Technology, and she's the CIO. So she's got, she's got a big, big job. And so we're really fortunate to have her. She is a leader and an advocate in regional collaboration where she served on many IT committees and with professional groups, including the Washington Metropolitan Council of Governments, where she's currently the CIO committee chair. She's a dedicated public servant. Wanda has received many state and national awards, and she's been instrumental 
for Prince George's County as a leader in the number one ranking in the National 2021 Digital County Survey. She's also been named the 2020 IT Executive of the Year by Prince George's County's Executive. Welcome Wanda Gibson. Would you say a few words? Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, it's very nice to be here and thank you so much, Senator Benson for inviting me to be part of this very important series of topics. Um, of course, I've been in the IT industry for many, many years. I feel like I started right fresh out of college being in a C-suite, a position as I started out being the executive director of university computing uh, for Howard University way back when I was, I think, about in my early 30s. So I had to learn very quickly, uh, but I started actually in the IT industry. And so that's how I arrived there supporting uh, public sector entities. Um, so uh, in my journey, I came uh, from another uh, big county in this national capital region, and I came over to join Prince George's County, where I have my home, uh, in order to be part of the Alice's Brooks administration, and then to take the Prince George's County to the next generation, next level of a digital enterprise as we continue to move forward. Um, I was very pleased to do that. Um, I had worked with the previous Prince George's County um, uh, folks in IT, CIOs, et cetera, et cetera, because one of the things that we do in the region is share and collaborate because these kinds of problems like cyber, for example, and IT, they're just not unique to one place. And of course, you know, our citizenry, they live, work and play all over the place. And so we wanna make sure that there is sort of common knowledge available and awareness because as you said, you know, our, my concern is of course, are my end users and the government and their uh, cyber hygiene as they use systems in order to do the business of the county government. Also, my responsibility includes making sure that the county's data is protected from unauthorized access and from also um, ransomware and things like that so the county can continue to function as we continue to push forward and provide more digital opportunities in the county agencies so they can work more online and interactive uh, with the public and very safely. So um, that's what um, I was uh, brought over to do. And um, I'm also uh, working continuously, by the way, with the National Capital Region under Homeland Security, who has a big priority for cybersecurity for all of its governments. Because when we do things like, for example, we send you know, public safety out to do first responding work. We have healthcare that the county also provides. We have uh, land development and processes and all these kinds of things. Um, our constituents you know, are very tech savvy and they'd like to interact very safely and very interactively uh, with Prince George's County. And so that is part of what I was brought here in order to pursue forward uh, for the county. So thank you very much again for having me. And um, I actually kind of created the next person you might be introducing um, as part of one of the marquee uh, achievements of the first year of this administration. So I will stop there and allow you to go uh, forward with that next uh, guest. Thank you so much. And, and your energy and your enthusiasm about our ability to address this area is, is contagious. So thank you for your opening remarks. And we certainly look, we look forward to hearing more from you shortly. Our second presenter is Miss Nikki Bims, who is an inf who's information technology career spans 30 years. She has over 30 years experience across the public and private sectors. She served 20 of her 30 year career in service as an enlisted soldier and warrant officer working in various capacities, including computer programming, Cisco Academy instructor, satellite communications expert and detachment commander for the United States Army. Today, Nikki works with all branches and all levels of government in Prince George's County, and she's a lead expert for cybersecurity matters, including but not limited to information systems, data, internet resources, and industrial automation. Industrial automation. These aren't words I use in my daily vocabulary. So I'm so pleased that we have expert Nikki Bims. Would you say a few words to our audience? Thank you so much for having me, Senator. It really is, a, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited about this topic um, because I know it's gonna be a lot of fun and it means a lot, of, to, a lot to this audience. We all deal with this 
particular topic every day. And um, just looking forward to the collaborative effort here to share and, and iron sharp as iron here to make sure that we all keep each other safe. As Wanda mentioned, she created my position here in Prince George's County, and I'm very excited to take the helm here for cybersecurity, to look at my focus is not only protecting the folks here who work within the county, but the folks who live in Prince George's County. They, they, they bank and, and they pay taxes and do everything here within Prince George's County. And it's my responsibility, a lot on my shoulders to make sure that their information is protected and kept safe. So over these, over these last few years, as you mentioned in my background in the military, and in my time out of the military, working with what we call the Beltway Bandits, um, from uh, government contracting to uh, military service, and now working in the local government, this is uh, really a great opportunity with a great county that is very forward thinking. And I, I think it's something to be very proud of. And uh, thanks again for the opportunity to be here to, to share with all of you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. And already we know that we have strong, talented people in Prince George's government. Our county executive has done a phenomenal job tapping a great team. And we can all sleep better at night knowing that you all have our backs in Prince George's County. We also thought it would be very helpful for our panel tonight to have a member of our private uh, business community. So we're joined by the president and CEO of Engine, Terry Spigner. He is, uh, Terry is a IT professional who I've had the pleasure of working with and knowing for over two decades. He brings a wealth of experience and has served the state of Maryland in many capacities, including assisting with work groups in an advisory capacity, including a work group that I chaired just last year. Uh, Terry has over 27 years experience serving businesses in the Washington DC metropolitan region. And he's also a nationally recognized leader in the IT industry. He emphasizes the importance of including customers in the conversation, listening to their needs and delivering solutions that leave his customers completely satisfied. Please join me in welcoming CEO Terry Spigner. Senator, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, participate in this, this very important conversation. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I wish I could live up to uh, everything that you just said about Terry Spigner. One day I, I aspire to be everything that you just said. Um, this conversation is, is, is going to be fun this evening. And what we're looking forward to is, is breaking down cybersecurity into a layperson terminology and layperson speak. We're not gonna be super technical. We're gonna okay. be conversational. And that's how we uh, deal with technology for our customers. Uh, our customers look for technology to get an end result, not to become an expert in technology. They're interested in making sure that they can accomplish those things, which they're they're interested in, whether it's architecture, whether it's legal, whether it's healthcare, state, local, federal government, education, whatever, uh, nonprofits, whatever their, their roles are in their businesses, they just want to get their jobs done. And technology happens to be uh, what they need in order to get that done. And we want to make sure they're, they're able to get it done safely as they're um, doing their job and relying on uh, the internet and cyber, tech, uh, cyber tools and what have you. So I look forward to the conversation. Let's get it on. All right. So we have, as I mentioned, we have a series of questions that have been submitted to us. Um, so we're just going to um, ask that we get all of our panelists on the screen and we're going to just um, ask questions. And each of you, if you feel comfortable responding to the questions, we just invite you to do that. Um, I'll ask a few of the questions that I have and other members of my team will also be asking questions that have been submitted from people who are very interested in hearing more about this topic. So the first question, many of us are, are, especially during these times when we're working remote, we're doing a lot of business on the web. We're um, communicating with, with businesses through websites and we're conducting, businesses through, uh, con conducting business through the websites that we, we visit. So how do we know when a website is secure? How can we tell if a website is secure? Senator Griffith, I'll take that uh, question. You know a website is secure when you 
go to any web page and at the very top left, you see HTTPS. The S means that that site is secure. If you only see HTTP, that site is not secure. The S means that you now have an SSL or, or secure sockets layer uh, certificate on that site, which means that all the data that you're sending between your computer and that website is encrypted. It's not just open data that can be intercepted between you and that website. So that's how you know if a website is secure. And if it's not secure these days, it will have a, an alarm at the top left where the address is. It'll have a little alarm that tells you that this is only HTTP, which means you're not gonna be communicating securely with whomever website you're uh, interfacing with. So remember HTTPS, and if you see a little alarm at the top left, that's bad. That means that your information is not encrypted between your computer and that mm -hmm. website. So the, the alarm is actually something we can visibly see. Absolutely. Huh, I have to pay more attention. Okay, thank you for that. Um, another question that we had and, and several uh, people that have uh, communicated with our office uh, have been uh, interacting with what they believe is phishing. And so we'd like to hear a little bit about what a phishing attack is, what that looks like, you know, how do we know when someone is phishing? I'll take that. With a pH, with a pH, right? With Not a pH, okay. with a pH. So the phishing means just that, trying to get information from you that we can now exploit. Uh, and I'll throw in vishing, just because we all get a lot of phone calls, vishing with a V, uh, where people are asking you for information to try to get you to share something. They pretend to be from your mortgage company and say that your payment is late. Would you like to make a payment right now? things like that to get your card information. But for phishing, um, we see it in our phones with text messages. We see it, of course, quite a few in our inboxes. This time of year, we're getting a lot of it that's related to shopping. I received one that said that my Macy's card, that someone spent $9,000 recently on my Macy's, Macy's card. Well, that's interesting because I recently lowered the limit to 4,500. So that was the first common sense red flag of, you're not using my card. So um, some things just are about common sense. If you all would bring up the slides, I think I have five examples here of some phishing emails that we can all look at together. Thanks, I'm bringing them up now. Thanks, Karen. Okay, so on your left, you'll see the email that you receive in your inbox. And then on the right, I have it actually highlighted with flags to show what are the things that you should look for. You see that those things are, are, are marked in red. I actually use a tool like this with uh, people here in our county to keep our folks aware and, and make sure that they're always paying attention to the emails that they're getting. First red flag is, it says Amazon. Okay, look, Senator. <laughs> It says Amazon. So that's where you can go ahead and stop and, and, and hit, hit the delete button. The worst thing you can do is click on that box that says check gift card balance. One, do you even have an Amazon gift card? But it's Christmas time. So someone may have sent you one. So you immediately go to say, hey, great. Somebody sent me a gift card, let me click on it. When you click on that, it will start to ask you for information and start to collect information from you that, so that it can be exploited. If you look on the right, this is one that maybe won't jump out, but I want you to think about this. It says, uh, it says we wanted to give you a simple way to check your Amazon gift card power, uh, balance in the first paragraph. It, said all you, it says all you have to do is use the button below, enter the card number and the pin. It's going to one, either rush you or encourage you to go and click on something. And it'll keep, sometimes in, in, a, in something with more text, it'll keep reminding you, trying to get you to focus on, go click that. Please click that because that's what I need you to do um, to get the information that I need. The other thing that you can do is up in the from and reply to areas, if you, if you hover, many times the address you see is not what will show up when you hover. It will look completely different. So while it may actually look like Amazon customer service, when you hover, it may say something entirely different, which is a red flag as well. Let's go to the next one.
next one. I'm sorry, give me one second, please. So, so while this is kind of going on, uh, we uh, actually perpetrated this, I'm gonna use that word on the entire county government. Um, mm -hmm. And so Nikki's team were putting these very cleverly done um, examples out there to see how many people would actually click. And I do want to say that the leadership was very savvy because I thought that I was being spammed because I was getting all kind of email notes. Should I click on this? Should I click on this? So, so Nikki's um, work was very effective. Nikki? Thank you. And, and, and it's, it's interesting because now we're getting messages about legitimate things asking if they should click. And I, I'll take that over you actually clicking. So what's the danger of clicking on something in a phishing email? It takes one person to do that to launch an attack on this entire, entire county. It takes one person in your household to open an email on a smart form, uh, phone or a device to cause a problem in your home, like clicking on a phishing. It, it takes one click to lose your identity and spend your time fighting with people over. You're not the one who went out and bought that item. Well, they captured all of that information from you. So this one is another one. I find that if we do banking, Amazon, Netflix, people click, they click very quickly. So first thing I'll say is common sense. Do you bank with Chase? If you don't bank with Chase, you should not click on anything here. The next thing that would concern me is, did someone steal my identity? And so I may reach out to Chase directly to say I received an email, here's what it looks like. And normally they will tell you forward that email here, that's a phishing uh, attack. They tell you where, where to send it. But all I really ultimately care about is, let me make sure that this is not me, that, that somebody didn't do something in my name. The other thing is I actually have my credit, my credit report frozen, which is another subject. So that if you wanted to go and get a credit card or do something with it, it's all that's frozen. So it would not allow you to do it anyway. Um, but that's another topic. But for the, this email, again, it's prompting you to click uh, it may or may not be your bank. And if you know that you're not waiting for a document from Chase and you do bank with them, pick up the phone. That's the best way to manage it. Pick up the phone before you actually click on anything. It's a pain. It slows you down. It's worth doing. Let's look at the next one. FedEx, big one for Christmas time. So when you start looking at this, and I tell you, I have a lot of packages coming to my home, mostly from Amazon. So when I see phishing emails with Amazon shipping, it, 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 it's a red flag. Suddenly all of you disappeared. So I thought I was in the meeting by myself. Um, again, if you look off to the right, it's asking you to click update address. Um, and it's kind of a hard one to, to catch because there's not a lot, a lot going on here that really is a red flag other than the fact that the address looks, uh, looks a little funny. It's a FedEx.net, which is interesting. And then it has an update address button. I, the only defense you really have against something like this is, I know I'm not expecting a package. I'm not gonna click here to update or change any address. Let me reach out to FedEx and find out what's going on. Next one. Netflix, look at how Netflix is spelled. I actually had quite a few people click on this. Um, there's your red flag, Netflix. So uh, many of us are using it. So we both, we all jump out and look at it and think, oh, that there's something wrong. Uh, if you look over to the right for the red flag, it says we're asking you to connect your cell phone number to your existing account or create a new account by using the button below. The other thing I do, I go log directly into my account. I, don't, I account. I don't use anything in these emails. Let me go look at my account and see what makes sense. If I didn't catch the fact that it says net FLX and that the email address says the same. And I think that's the last one. And I know that was a long answer, Senator, but. No, that was very good. Excellent. I, I couldn't see everyone who was watching, but I know that I was seeing, I was nodding over here because I, I know that I have seen something that said, you're going to miss out if you don't click this. And, mm -hmm. and so now mm -hmm. I know that that is something that is an obvious red flag. I'm going to be looking for those things. So thank you very much. That was, that was very good. Very good information. Um, all right. So Someone has asked what a botnet is and how does how does it work? So do any of our panelists? 
feel comfortable. I'll take that question though. Okay. Senator Griffith. Because I don't. <laughs> well, a botnet is when a group of computers that are set up by cyber criminals or hackers are used to take their direction from a central computer to go out and attack an environment, to attack a network. So it's a bots are essentially robots, mm -hmm. computers that are used as robots to just follow the direction of a master computer to do to take carry on out an attack. So that's what a botnet is. Boy, we have people who have so much time on their hands to be able to create these things to torment the rest of us. Okay. Okay. The next question is, um, is asking about two-step verification or authentication. Is this something that we need to do? Is this a process? Because it seems like an extra step and you're trying to get stuff mm -hmm. done. Is it really valuable? Is it something we need to do? Yeah. Um, so, so I'll go ahead and take that because yeah, it started some years ago called um, two-factor authentication, and now the best practice is multi-factor authentication MFA, if people see that. And it is worthwhile when you first establish something, so you're establishing who you are, your digital identity by doing through those extra steps in the first place. So then when you're interacting with um, a computer system or something that you are now attached to as a user, it knows that it is you and not somebody else. And this is really important, especially when people use smartphones and all these things to do all kinds of stuff in their daily lives, to basically set up a secure authentication mechanism with the different enterprises that you might do business with so that you could be as assured as possible that somebody else hasn't stolen your identity and then representing themselves as you, doing business as you because you haven't set up an authentication process with that, either it's your, um, you know, your shopping or, or your business office or your doctor's office, all these kinds of things are very, very, very important. And in the age of um, online telemedicine and all these kinds of things, you wanna make sure that you, it's you, and you also wanna make sure on the other side of that type of issue, that when they are looking for you, it's you and not somebody else. So there are errors and mistakes made with maybe your medical records or treatments, uh, prescriptions and all kinds of things. So multi-factor authentication is very important and anyone using any kind of device should set that up if they're doing online business and transactions in their uh, work and their regular daily life. Excellent, thank you. So I guess it's worth the extra step because the time we would spend unraveling someone having gotten your stuff, you kind of look back and say, what was I actually thinking there, right? Okay. So, um, and I should remind those of you who are in the audience, if you have questions, please feel free to type those into the chat room. We will be getting to those in a little bit. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and I'm going to check in with some of my team who I know are receiving questions. I got to tell you, we've been receiving questions by telephone, by text, and through our emails. So um, we appreciate our panelists being so receptive to this, this process. So the next question is, what makes a strong password? I know a lot of times when I'm signing up for something, they offer me all these things, these letter number thing, and I don't even know I'll never remember it. So tell us, what do we really need to know? What makes a strong password? I'm going to start and then turn it over to Nikki. Okay. Strong passwords, everybody hates them. Okay. But there's a reason for them. And so it's a combination of numbers, letters, uppercase, lowercase, special characters, et cetera, et cetera. And for some places, and so I will admit I'm, I'm a senior citizen, so it could be become increasingly more difficult. Um, but it's worthwhile because if you have something too easy, so say somebody's password, oh, it's my child's name, okay? Oh, it's my street address or whatever. That is just way too easy for someone else to compromise and then here again, represent themselves as you. It is very difficult, but I can tell most companies, like uh, when you're handling your accounts online, they're requiring it and then, oh, good grief. And it's kind of telling you as you progressively put in your password has got a red light. Okay, 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 it's not good enough. Okay, then you may add a character. Okay, now you have a yellow light. Okay, it's green, it's good. It's 
strong, okay? And that there's other ways that some um, other thinkers in academia and others that think that people could do it by, maybe it could be a phrase that you're more able to remember, okay, um, than trying to create some hieroglyphic that you probably don't have an opportunity to remember. And the other thing, and this is really low tech, and this is how people compromise themselves every day with these things, okay? So people create passwords that there's, they have no way that they're ever, ever gonna be able to remember it. So then they stick this thing on their computer and they leave it there, okay? So any number of people can go along, oh, let me check this out. And for people with households with children, of course, children are curious, but they're smarter than we were when we were that, when, at that age. And so they know exactly how to use these kind of mechanisms. And so that's why it is important in households for people to have strong, good, um, what I call cyber hygiene practices like that, so they can protect themselves and their families. But, but Nikki, uh, from your perspective as the chief security officer, this whole strong password um, uh, practice, can you talk a little bit more about it? It's, it's a challenge, I know, because we have so many passwords and we're always uh, encouraged to have unique passwords. So for me, and I'll let you all laugh at me, my staff laughs at me, my kids laugh at me, I have a password safe. You all, I'm gonna show it to you, I have to get rid of my background, but it's a little um, device that runs on three AAA batteries that I, I purchase, and all of my passwords are, are in there and I can scroll through them, it's digital, and it's offline, it has no Bluetooth, nothing else, and all of my passwords are unique for everything in my life, and they're all in this one password safe. It looks like a two-way pager. It's not high tech at all. Um, and I care, Terry's laughing at me. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a level of paranoia that I, I think in my position, you, you should reach. Um, but I am very careful about not using, about passwords being unique. I recently had an email come in and, and they gave me pa a password that I knew was mine. And it took me a long time to try to remember where did it come from? It was probably about 15 years old on a website for electronic greeting cards. But they shared it with me and, and then offered a ransom to share personal information about me. Now, they didn't have any real personal information, but showing me a password that was familiar to me makes me think, oh, they have something. What they've done is hack something unsecure somewhere. And if I use that same password for my bank account, now they've already got a, a, a password that they can go bounce around to the things that they think I may be using with my email address and start trying this password, testing it on other things. That's why it's so important that those passwords uh, be unique. And Terry, I know you had some input on passwords as well. Sure, thank you, Nikki. Um, one good best practice for creating a strong password is, is certainly using multiple types of characters, different types of characters, a special character, uppercase, lowercase, a number. So adding all those different components into a password gives you a level of complexity. Also the length of the password makes it harder for a uh, cyber criminal to hack it or to try to figure out a way to crack your password. Um, I'm going to put a, an example of a uh, strong password in the chat, and you'll sort of get an idea of what I'm talking about, having all those multiple components in the password. Uh, so if you can look in your chat, here's an example of a strong password. It starts off with a special character, which is an explanation point, and the uppercase letter. It has a number. It has lowercase letters. And it's at least, I think it's at least nine or 10 digits, I mean, 10 not characters, okay? What does that say, Senator? It says, I have no idea. I am Denzel. Denzel. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Leticia. <laughs> so that's an example of a strong password. <laughs> I was thinking, I was looking at it thinking, we should not use this one. That's what I was actually thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Do but not you, copy and paste this right. and use it. But you get the gist that you can create, as uh, the CIO said, a password phrase and just change it up so that you'll know what it is, but it'd be hard for anyone else to crack it. That 
So that's an example of a passphrase. I am somebody or whatever it is, and you just mix up the characters, lowercase, uppercase, and special characters. Okay. Interesting. I will confess at this point to our panel and all those who are viewing, at one point there was a site where you could test your password for your strength to for its strength. You just type your, I know, look at her. <laughs> Nikki's face is going, no, you didn't. Yes, I did. I typed passwords in and it would go weak. And then I type in, try something. And then I thought, boy, if I use these, I've now fed this computer system, all of my password ideas. It took me a while to figure it out, but I caught on to the fact that that wasn't too bright. So we're getting there. Thank you all so much for that answer. And we know we can do better. Most of us can do better with the password. So I'm gonna pause right now. We do have some more questions, but I want to give Karen an opportunity. We've had some come in uh, on chat and I wanna just pause and, and Karen, do you wanna take a couple of questions? Sure, um, let me get into the chat real quick. Um, we received a few, but um, I guess this, this one is just to piggyback off of Ms. Bims, um, which she was talking about earlier, but uh, Sister Joy Alfred is asking, what is the purpose of and procedure for freezing your credit report? So um, I have LifeLock and Experian um, that, that I monitor on an app on my phone. Um, both of those allow me to freeze my credit reports. I have I freeze the Experian report through their app. I froze, I'm sorry, the Experian report through their app and then the other two through LifeLock. I have not found, and I was looking for this the other day, uh, one item that freezes them all. Some people offer these things online, but if it's not from a trusted so source, never heard of this, I'm not putting in all of my credit card, my credit information to ask them to freeze my credit reports. So I am doing it individually. I always laugh and say when I had bad credit, it was a non-issue because they'll decline them too. But uh, you know, now it's, it's, it's all about freezing and protecting my information. So you will have to go to each of those individual sites to um, subscribe and freeze your credit report. And then don't forget, I'm in the middle of, I was buying a car, I forgot that it was frozen. But don't forget to unfreeze it when you plan to use your credit and then freeze it again. Good information. Um, let's see, we received another question. Is there a recommended password manager app that you'd recommend? I'm going to, I'll toss that to Terry only because I'm paranoid. So I won't use an app. Me I, I, I use an offline tool. I mean, it's a AAA battery, like I said, but Terry, if you, you know, have something that you may recommend as a password yeah, we app. Have, yeah, there's a, a password apps that uh, we recommend and that we implement for our clients. Um, one is a password locker. Another one is pass safe. Um, so uh, we can, uh, I can put, um, some information in the chat on those, but those are good ones that uh, are meant for uh, not only individuals, but uh, corporations. All right, thank you for that. And let's see, um, I had another question. Is it good or safe to electronically save your password so we can log in quickly in the future? So saving your okay. password is okay if and only if you have multi-factor authentication also tied to that account, whether it's Facebook, LinkedIn, your banking account, or any account that's gonna have your personal identifiable information, your PII, or any of your financial information. So if I, every now and then I get lazy, now I may save a password for like Amazon or whatever on my computer, but even if you log into Amazon, it's sending me a message to my cell phone as that second authentication method. So you have to have both my Amazon password and my cell phone in your possession in order to get into my account. So that goes back to what CIO Gibson was talking about on multi-factor and two-factor authentication, which essentially I, is something I know and something I have in order for you to get into my account. Now, just, just piggybacking on this, because now with e-commerce, you see a lot of that. And even I have been in this business for over 30 some years. I always pause when the app says, do you want us to save this password? And I'm thinking, well, if I'm going to use it all the time, maybe I might want to do that. This is a legitimate you know, e-merchant. But I'm like, eh, I'm just using it one time. No, I don't want this company to have my password saved just in case they are compromised somehow 
And then all of my information is in their um, you know, stores and now it's exposed and I have to change everything. People will remember the infamous uh, Target breach, okay? Where everybody is like buying things with their credit cards and we trust these companies, okay? These are mega um, merchants or whatever. Well, does everybody know how Target got breached? Well, everything is automated now. And so Senator Griffith, you talked about is one of the things that we're trying to secure now industrial automation systems. Well, an example of one of those is HVAC, okay? So a lot of these corporations or whatever, uh, their utilities that manage their stores and whatever, they're, they're automated. And so then in modern times, the person that's managing that system is coming through the internet to do whatever that they're doing to do system administration on HVAC. Well, in that particular instance, this has been highly publicized, by the way, um, that HVAC system is sitting on the same network as the point of sale system to which people come to the store. It's a cash register point of sale and, you know, swipe their cards, et cetera, et cetera. So all of that information is sitting on a network that the technician for the utility company happened to be able to, oh, guess what I see? I'm seeing my HVAC system. Oh, what is that over there that I can see? And, and went meandered over there. And that's how that information was compromised. So um, even the biggest uh, companies that one would think have all the protection in place, they may not. Now that doesn't mean everybody stopped shopping, okay? Uh, that just means these companies, and that was a few years back. So these companies have got a, a big awakening and everybody now is putting in all of these kinds of protections. So even sometimes with your cash register and it's asking you to push a few more buttons and you're thinking, okay, that's a nuisance. I didn't used to have to do that. No, that's a good thing they have implemented to also protect the security of your money. Excellent information. And uh, we have one more that we'll go with. Um, can you discuss the use of third party authenticators such as Google Authenticator, mm -hmm. Duo, Microsoft Authenticator in conjunction with your passwords as an extra layer of protection? But before anybody says anything, I'm going to say we can't say we can guarantee anybody's anything. But with that said, uh, Nikki, do you want to do you have a comment about it? We were not going to also um, score them, you know? Yeah. So um, I actually use Google Authenticator and I'm not promoting it. Um, it's, it's back to the multi factor is one of the other items that you use um, that it generates a code for you when you're trying to log in. Um, so you try to get in and then it uh, authenticator sends a text or email. I, I can't remember. I use a few authenticators here, but a text and, it, and then a code is automatically in my phone. I have it set up. It automatically plugs the code into the item that I'm trying to authenticate to. And I just hit the button and go. But that's uh, to Terry's point. That's the second factor after I've logged in. So that's back. We all we keep revisiting, which is great. We keep revisiting the idea of multi-factor, of more than one way to get into everything, and that those authenticators, making sure they're from a, a reliable source. Uh, Google Authenticator is definitely one that I I personally use. Um, is is key. Uh, I would be very careful about going online and finding something that's odd or unfamiliar, and they're saying they're an authenticator or hey, this is free, or take this app. If you've never heard of it, and if you start researching and you can't find much about it, stay away from it. Thank you, thank you. All right, we're gonna switch who's asking questions now and turn to Chief of Staff, Letitia Beal. Letitia, you have some questions on your desk. Yes, I do. Right. Um, can. can any panelists explain to me what ransomware is? I know we've, it's been hitting a lot of like big cities and different entities and someone kind of shed some light on that so that the commoner can understand what it is. So, so I will start and kick it off because to me, it's a catchphrase for a whole lot of different ways a malware can get in and take control of hijack, disable a, a technology function. And then because it is disabled, so then you, your system, you don't have any way to get rid of this thing. It's locked you down. Um, then the perpetrator asks for money in order to basically, you give me money and I'll give you the key to unlock the thing that I have now injected into your system. And that's why this catchphrase ransomware, now Tiki can, and Terry give a more technical answer, but that's basically what it is. And 
ransomware uh, perpetrators started out with really low level dollar requests. So a lot of entities were like, okay, let's just pay it because it's better to do that. It's cost us so much money to be locked down. We don't have ability to serve, um, to do our business with because we can't because our technology is locked down. Um, and then that is now recognized as, no, that's a bad practice to pay. Okay, because then it perpetrated a whole lot of other actors. Okay, let's do it, let's do it, let's do it. And so there's so many people out there trying to figure out ways to like compromise a network and then get paid. But honestly, even if you pay, this is no different than general law enforcement, you know, philosophy, still might not be able to get into and unlock, you know, your, your networks, your systems, your data. So um, uh, this ransomware, it's a, it's a, it's a crime. And there's cyber criminals out there and cyber hackers and all these kind of different labels that are put on to the people that are out there that absolutely have nothing to do. Actually, I will say they have something to do. They've created a negative criminal enterprise uh, through cyber. So this is what their job is. And all day long, you know, the industry is trying to come up with ways to protect. And at the same time, these underworld cyber criminals are already figuring out ways to compromise then the protective measures that are in place. And so, um, Nikki, um, you know, your, your perspective on ransomware. Well, I think from a, a home perspective, once the ransom, ha once your computer has become, what they do is go in and encrypt all your files and then offer to sell everything back to you. Um, so it, it, <laughs> it really depends. At, at home, you will see it pop up. And if you, you Google and look for messages, it will pop up and say, something you know that hackers think is really cool that uh i own you you need to do this 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 and this and pay me in bitcoin or um which is is a really big one um and so you have to make a choice the first thing i would say is unplug uh, your network get everything that's the first thing i would do but now you need to make a choice i as as cio gibson said i would not pay to me that that laptop or whatever that device is is just lost um I, I'm, if I can't figure out how to recover that myself, it's just lost. Uh, if you are hosting some type of data on there that you think is so that you cannot, um, you, you cannot live without and you need to try to get back into it, there are some folks that you can go out and try to pay to recover um, that, that device. It's pretty expensive. Um, but at, the biggest thing is to try to prevent these things with having the right antivirus software, protecting your network at home, all the other things not clicking on phishing emails, everything we're talking about here to prevent something like that from happening. Yeah. And, and just nope. to kind, kind of step step back into it in terms of protective measures, sometimes it's really a common sense, low tech solution. Like for example, especially if you do all your business from home and your kids are doing their schoolwork from home and whatever, to have multiple environments, okay, to have redundant environments. So if what happens, somebody gets a hold of it, and this trash is this trash you anymore? You can basically have another system kind of ready to go fire that up so you can continue to do your business. And so people don't think about that. People are thinking about some fancy, you know, cybersecurity tool solutions that are going to cost you, you know, lots of money every year. Have a second redundant computer on standby. It's protected, not interconnected with the one that could get compromised, so you can continue to function. Throw so, that other one just in yeah. the trash. And, and I'll wrap this up with one of the best practices that we recommend to all of our customers. I know we got, I think, a couple of customers who are on, on, on the, uh, uh, the Zoom here with us is there's only one real fail-safe way to protect yourself from a ransomware, and that is to have your data backed up. Because what they're selling you is, I have your data, I've locked it down, and if it's important to you, you will pay me to get it. Well, if I have my data backed up, it's like, okay, no problem. I'll just recover my data from my backup. I may lose one hour of data. I may lose one day. I may lose one week, but I won't lose my entire life uh, work of data. So having your data backed up is just not for corporations. It's also important for personal home use uh, and your personal use of your own uh, network and your own computer. Back up your data so that you don't lose everything. You may lose something, but it won't be everything. And the something you lose may not be worth the thousand dollars or $5,000 that they want to charge you in order to get it back. 
Thank you for all your answers. Now, I just want a point of clarity. They don't literally mean throw your computer away because I don't want somebody to get ransomware and then they throw their computer in the trash and then they get hacked because they took Hey, I, honestly, a grinder, okay? <laughs> Take um, the motherboard out, whatever, just get rid of it. Right, right. And, and, and while you're bringing that up, there are actually entities that will you can pay to get rid of your hard drive, stuff like that, right? That, that is correct. Um, for some people, they may have a service by where they can get their uh, computers wiped and then certified. Um, but the technology is changing so rapidly. That's why, you know, you got to keep yourself up to and modern and if you're going to be using technology. You know, not like, you know, well, you know, here's a used one that I got like four years ago and I'll just try to use that because that one probably will be more subject to um, being compromised and there is no fix. Technology continues to move forward. If I could add to that, I had this conversation yesterday. Um, we used to be able to take a screwdriver or a hammer and bang on a hard drive and destroy it and throw it in the trash. That actually does not work for the new hard drives. Mm -hmm. So you drop a hole in, in many of these new hard drives, I can recover the data from that drive. That's exactly drop it off at Goodwill. You think you've wiped it with some freeware online. Uh, one of the best things to do is go buy a bunch of computers from those types of places and just see what data you can get off of because mm -hmm. they are full of information. Just so you know. Right. Very, very, very scary. Was, you know, because for a second, I was thinking it's kind of good for people like me that have to call Terry and say, I can't find my stuff. Can you help me? <laughs> then it can be recovered. It's bad if you think you've gotten, you know, like you said, if somebody gets your stuff that's not supposed to have it. So, yikes. And, and the senator does have a very good geek on speed call. <laughs> Could you provide his name by any chance? <laughs> right next to you on the Zoom. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> okay. um, can someone shed some light on what, what is a private browser? What is private browsing, I should say? Uh, I'll, take, I'll take that one. Private browsing, there's different website browsers out there that does not collect your data and your web browsing history. And most of the popular web browsers out there, whether it's Chrome or Firefox or even uh, Microsoft Internet Explorer or um, Microsoft Edge has an option where you can go into private browsing. Now, don't let that give you a false sense of pri my private browsing is not gonna keep everything private because at the end of the day, you're still using whether it's AT&T, whether it's Verizon Files or Comcast, or what have you, they still see where you're going. So they know, even though you're in private browsing and it's not going to going to save cookies and it's not going to save your browsing history, that internet service provider still sees everywhere every person who's connected to their service is going. So privacy is not necessarily true privacy. Actually, I'm gonna say something might be um, a little bit controversial. Uh, a privacy that ship has sailed, okay? Um, if you've shopped anywhere, use a credit card anywhere, if you're going online to do anything anywhere, your information is out there because in the background, you know, some of these firms, they're in the business of selling data and information about people to other companies. So all of a sudden weird things are showing up. How would you like this? So I know you want that, et cetera. So where did that come from? And that is the reason why when you're in a digital age and you're using digital capabilities for everybody to understand what you're signing up for and then use the safe practices and actually just good common sense. If something doesn't look right, it doesn't feel right to you, just ignore it and move on and do something else. So those of you with slick teenagers, I have two teenage boys uh, who think going to private browsers or clearing stuff means I can't tell what they're doing. I use a great tool called I Am Big Brother. And so it records everything that they are typing. It takes screenshots of the screen. Um, there's lots of tools like that um, that show everything that's going on that, on that computer. And then it occasionally sends me a report of everything that's going on. So um, I will tell you, all of you, if you're in my home and you're on my computer, I am watching you. But um, it is, was designed for my two teenagers and it is a great tool for those of you who want to see what's going on with the young folks in your home and with human trafficking and other things that are going on these days, it's not a bad deal to keep an eye on it. Uh, thank you. 
Another question. I, I know some people who work for like federal agencies who refuse to come into the age of like the iPhone. Like they're still using the flip phone because they don't think anybody attracts them. My question is, is there, well, the question is, can I completely stop my cell phone or mobile phone from being tracked? Let the record reflect all three panelists went. No. <laughs> so I think I think it was already said now the device is one thing and when you're using it your data your voice is being transmitted through the big network of carriers network it's out there in the open okay and if somebody wants to put the tool on there and suck that information data out of the network that's what people can do um talk about wireless and wireless safety for example and that's another reason why this whole uh, arena of industrial technology. So there's things called drones, for example, correct? And they're automated and they're computerized and they're programmed to go and do what they can do. Well, hmm, I'm a cyber criminal. I want to hijack that drone and send it somewhere else. Okay, because I know that particular company doesn't have good cyber protections in there. And I might be able to crack in there just for the bedevilment of it all. And so that's how serious this whole cyber thing is when you're using the internet, you're, you don't know what companies network your information and your data and whatever is traveling through to get to the end point. Yeah. I can add a little bit to that. If anybody in here is a fan of the first 48 television show, the one thing that captures just about every last one of those criminals is when their cell phone pinged off of a tower. When their wireless access that's on their cell phone, their Wi-Fi pinged off of a wireless access point. So you can put your phone into incognito mode. You can turn off uh, the GPS on your phone. But as soon as that you uh, travel and that phone hits a cell tower, you are now trackable. As soon as you take that phone out and connect to a Starbucks or some library internet uh, wireless access point, you are now trackable because that phone is going to register that, hey, I'm here. Now, so, you know, in, in my profession work with Homeland Security and, um, and uh, law enforcement over the years, uh, folks, you want to be tracked, okay? Because if something happens to you and you're, um, you know, unable to function, you want to be able to be found and rescued. So, um, you know, it's not bad, you know, to, to be tracked. And I know, um, you know, some people think about, I don't want people to know my business. Okay, well, if you're not going to rob the bank, I, you know, I think you're safe with your business about. Uh, but no, seriously, um, these are very good protections for people because you never know what could happen. Understood. Uh, I think you kind of alluded to some of this. When, when I go, if I use a Wi-Fi in a restaurant, uh, Starbucks or whatever, is that, and I have to use the passport to get into it, is that a safe usage of... Um, internet. Personally, I don't do it because I pay for my service. So why do I want to get free service from somebody else and I don't know if it's secure or not? There, there are stories of people going in and setting up a hotspot that looks like the name of, I sit in IHOP, I name something IHOP, and I let all of you come in there and connect. I just sit at the table. And you're all actually on my network, not IHOP's uh, Wi-Fi. Then I see what I can do to you and what, what I can capture. So the question is, are you really on uh, their network? And look at you, like, there's a real, if you, are you really on their network um, at all? Again, I err on a little more paranoia than, than anyone else. I'm like Wanda, I try to use my own, uh, my own things and, and rather than use the public Wi-Fi. But when you're traveling and things like that, that's the nature of the beast. Now, I do carry a small kind of Google Chrome laptop that if I'm, I'm when I'm traveling, I'm in a hotel, my device that has my stuff on it, I don't bring with me one just because I'm traveling. And two, then I'm comfortable surfing on the net with that device while I'm traveling. But I will not log into my bank accounts. I won't do anything on that device while I'm using it. There's certain things that I will not do um, with, with the device. So Go ahead, Terry. One, yeah, one good practice on, um, well, on public Wi-Fi, regardless whether it's airport, hospital, Starbucks, hotel, it's public and it can be compromised. And as Nikki said, some if you're in a uh, hotel that has six, seven, eight floors, 
Someone could be a couple floors or a couple doors down from you, and they can set up a wireless access point to mimic that hotel's wireless access point and capture everything you're doing because you you will connect to it not knowing that it's not the correct one. When I'm on travel, I use my cellular phone as my hotspot. Some it's called tethering. It's called a hotspot. Uh, if you're using an Android versus an Apple, it's called different things, but most cell phones and cell phone carriers give you the ability to turn your cell phone into a wireless hotspot that only you can connect to in order to uh, be able to, to compute and, and communicate with the rest of the world and do your banking and all the other things you have to do. But I would not trust a, any public wireless access, even if it requires a password. You guys said this was going to be fun. This is scary. No, I know. I was just thinking. I was like, even if you're at the hotel and you have to put your last name and your room number, no. Wow. Jeez. You can you can be assured that your cell phone that you turn into a, a access point only you have that username and password, so you connect to that. And to be candid with you. Connecting to your cell phone is going to give you a better experience than connecting to the hotel, which is a shared internet access. You're getting dedicated when you connect to your cell phone and use that as your uh, internet access, wireless access point. This is not fun. I agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but it's good, good information, though. It's, it's good. good. It's good. But you specifically said it was going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, my last question is, and we started using this more working remotely, but uh, what kind of cybersecurity risks can we minimize by using VPNs or virtual private networks? So, so businesses tend to do that as a private communications channel between the person where they are into that enterprise's network. Okay, that's why it's called a virtual private network. So it's um, so for example, when the pandemic hit and the government, we were able to go virtual because we had virtual private network set up. So people working from home, if they want to get into any of the county systems and IT resource, they had to use that in order to get access into the county systems. If they did not have access to it or know how to use it, or whatever, they just weren't going to be able to do their work because we had it blocked. So that's a good thing. Now, I guess, uh, Terry, they have home versions of these things now because a lot of people are now working more from home and probably should invest to have these kinds of tools available to them at home in order to protect them and their families um, with everybody they're doing a lot of stuff through the internet these days. So, um, Terry, in terms of the private home VPN. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can have uh, a private VPN application on your laptop, your desktop, your cell phone. They're very inexpensive. It may cost, what, $30, $40, $50 a year. Um, and what that does is even if you feel compelled to connect to a public wireless access point uh, using your VPN, your data is encrypted. So no one can sniff that data and see what the data is that you're communicating across that network. So a VPN essentially encrypts that data. So it's always a good practice that if you're in an area that you definitely don't trust, but you still need to use their wireless access point, launch your VPN application and then use that wireless access point. Also, go ahead, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Do you have a recommendation for one or some? Um, this is not an endorsement, but I probably should name any particular products um, we should reach you directly. <laughs> Very good. Yes, reach me directly and I'll, I'll give you some and I'll tell you which one I use. For the holiday season, for the reason VPN is great is because e-commerce uh, websites look at your IP address to figure out how to charge you sometimes. So with VPN, that IP address is not visible. They can't tell where you're coming from and it actually will make a difference in, with certain store, online stores. And she's absolutely right. Uh, uh, you can connect to Amazon or Sears or May, well, Sears, well, Macy's or whatever uh, on your direct connection that says that you're in Upper Marlboro or Mitchellville or what have you. And you look at a, a, a product that may be, say, $100. I launch my VPN and say, hey, today, right now, I'm going to be in California. 
my I go back to that same site. It thinks I'm coming from California. That hundred dollar device uh, purchase may now be eighty dollars. So yes, they you pay based on where you live, not based on the <laughs> and virtual redlining. Yes, that's not okay. <laughs> yes, that's not okay. <laughs> yes. Okay, so we're gonna, um, I think Karen has some um, additional questions in the chat and then we're gonna open it up to those who are here if you wanna ask your questions directly. So as she pulls those last questions from the chat, I just had one quick question about updates. When I get these messages on my phone that says you need to update or on my computer, is that something that's helpful? Because sometimes I'm nervous that it's gonna do something and make things stop working. So the first update. thing I do, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was like updates up or updates. Well, the first thing I do, um, and I actually, I have the new Samsung flip phone and I loaded an update and I don't like all of the things that it changed, but you can't roll it back. Um, so the first thing I normally do is go and read, what is this update going to do? What will it change? Is it security related or not? And I actually, in total employee, this about a tool today, wait and let everybody else load it, see what problems they're having before I hit the button and, in, and install it right away. That's one thing. If it's coming from a trusted source, it's only, I can't, you can never guarantee that an update is, is safe. Uh, the vendor is Samsung, the vendor is Google. Um, we're trusting that because of those are reputable companies, that what they're sending us is not going to, you know, blow up our phones or our computers, but it, it's just not a guarantee. Some of those updates, updates fix a bug. Some are security related. Some of them you can simply opt out, uh, especially on your computer. If you set it to not automatically update, one, you need to remember to do it and you'll have to sift through those updates to determine which ones you'd like um, to add. Terry, you wanna add something, I wonder? Um, I was just going to say, um, and this is coming from a CIO, and so I guess it's really kind of funny. I'm like, I'm like uh, Nikki is. I'm not the first person to hit the update button mm -hmm. on my personal devices and whatever, because I'm like, do I really want to be bothered? Does this a change in my device now? I have no idea how to use it. I'm trying to figure out what it has done. Now, from a corporate standpoint, business standpoint, we run updates regularly for all of our computers hanging off of the county's network. And we expect folks to basically allow the updates to happen, but it does sometimes change things. So we already know we're gonna have some end users a little bit annoyed or what's going on. And that's why our service desk is ready to help people. But when you're kind of at home, you know, and you're trying to figure out what did this thing do to me? There should be uh, numbers provided to you by your carrier or whomever that you call immediately and get help. But we're in the digital age. So all this, these things that we're telling people it's not to frighten people, it's to really make good awareness so people can develop new and good practices, which they will. Um, your young folks or teenagers or whatever, they do this stuff very, very, very quickly and they probably adopt very, very quickly. Um, and they may be even a little bit more savvy than maybe we do in seeing the kinds of things that come because it's more in the way that they live growing up. And for us, it's like, okay, wow, look at all these things we have to do, but it's no different then um, you buy a house or you're in your home, you're not gonna leave the door unlocked. You're not gonna leave the window wide open. Somebody can just climb in there. And really it boils down as simply as this. Now I have to have good hygiene for how I use my digital experiences, just like I do in any other um, uh, uh, places uh, in my life. Um, I always tell uh, people that say awareness is the answer to everything because that people hear that, oh, you don't need to spend any money. You know, awareness is the answer. I said, okay, let me be aware. Okay, I'm the bank. You know what? I'm gonna leave the bank vault door wide open with all my gold in there. And I'm gonna put a sign on the side, but please don't go in here because you're not allowed or it's dangerous. Hmm, I'm the criminal. Uh, I'm a, I don't see anybody. I'm going in there and grab and run. So I know that seems like a very simplistic example, but basically it's a combination of awareness and putting good practices in place and making the investments that you need to make because this is managing your life now, this digital experience. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now I know that I'm at least I'm not the only one that's a little apprehensive. Okay, Karen, I know we have some more things that have come in the chat room. 
Yes, ma'am. Uh, we have a question. Uh, is it true that social media surveys are used to collect potential password information? Fishing. It's phishing. So, and where's that survey coming from? And even if it's coming from uh, Facebook or Twitter, why do they need to know? What, what do you gain by filling out a survey for them and giving them the name of your dog and your high school boyfriend? You know, um, they don't need to know this stuff. Uh, just don't, just stop. Don't fill it out. Uh, but yes, they have been known to uh, use these to collect information. We all do the, um, the questions. When you recover your password, it asks you the name of, uh, one of them asks the name of your last boyfriend, the name of your dog, the name of your first car. So you take one of these surveys with all of these things on it. Now I can piece all of that together and reset your accounts with some of those same security questions. So yes, that has happened. And I would just not take a survey at all. You're not gonna get anything for it. If they're promising, you, promising gifts or gift cards, I really do believe it's a scam. Thank you for that. That made me think of a survey that I took back in like the early 2000s that promised me an iPod mini. So yep, just still waiting on it. <laughs> still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about storing your information in the cloud to protect against ransomware? That is a good uh, practice. Anywhere you can back your data up at, at, totally separate from your device is a good practice. Even if you're backing it up to a external uh, hard drive, external USB drive or thumb drive, and then you disconnect that thumb drive and store it until you back up again, that is a good practice. Do not leave your backup device connected to your computer because if it get ransomware and if it gets the data encrypted, it's gonna encrypt all the drives, including the drive that's attached to it. So, but, but having it separated into the cloud is also a good practice. Can, can I, um, so, so in my previous place, I had a, a, a cyber chief um, like Nikki and whatever, and we used to debate these clouds all the time because it, the word is just used so liberally. So, so yeah, so your, your iPhone, your, your Samsung and Google's there, all clouds, okay, and they should be, if you're a commercial account with them, have a trusted source of, of storage of your data and information, but, um, you know, just kind of make sure you're checking on that because they could have problems internally. They're not going to announce it to the world and all of a sudden your, your data is gone. But with that said, the thing I do want to say is a lot of them now have life uh, cycles for storing people's data and so you got to remember this because they could basically say, you know what, we keep your data for five years. It's in the micro print somewhere on a piece of paper that came in your iPhone case or whatever. And then all of a sudden, you know, you just, oh, oh all my stuff is there. I'm safe whenever. Hey, where's my stuff? And then it's when you call the 800 number. It's like, oh, did you read this fine print? We only keep it for five years and blah, 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 blah. So, so people have to be aware and read and ask questions. You don't, you know, it's not like you're not smart asking questions because these companies don't tell people everything. They want you to buy their product and they want to keep you as a customer and they want to keep your, um, your contract going and going. But you have to take responsibility of this whole issue where you store your information. Um, and I uh, just want to might have two different ways to store it is what I would suggest, especially for things that are precious to you like photos, for example. And oh. Terry, I guess we have to trust that when people put their photos up there, because this is one question I get all the time. So can somebody go up there and get my photo, my image, and then you know, um, make themselves my identity, can people do that? So in your trusted source, you know, cloud storage, you know, you should have some comfort there, but like some kind of like, like low level, like gerrymandered up, like, okay, yeah, hey, I got servers in my basement or whatever, and I can store your stuff for you. Um, yeah, it's probably not a good idea. Hey, did I say servers in the basement? Does that remind everybody of a big political <laughs> problem some time ago? <laughs> All right, good information. And we have one more. Uh, my daughter put a protective password on a document and forgot the password. She went to Apple to try to get the document and they couldn't open it. Is there a way to figure out what the password is? Terry, you muted. Okay. If there's a way to pick, figure out the password, typically most cloud um, sites 
have a I forgot password. And then it gives you the ability to go through certain steps to prove that you are who you are. And then you can self set, reset your own password. Is it, uh, is it maybe a password on an Adobe file? Something like that. Mm. I'm not sure. It just says it was a document on a password. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, yep. Protected password on a document. Oh, the, the password is on a document. Mm -hmm. Yes. There are tools that will allow you to um, recover a document that has a password on it, whether it's an Excel file, Word file. Um, I, I can't mention those tools here, uh, but uh, as a as a super geek and an OG, you all you all know what an OG is, right? I'm an old geek. We know what we know what kind of tools to to use to uh, uh, get into files like that. Oh, that's what that G means. Yeah, old that's geek. what I mean. old geek. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there are companies out there that claim they're in the business be able to recover things from things like they're very expensive. But here's what's kind of like the ha ha kiki of it all that persons that have that kind of skill tend to also have the other hair side of the hat on to be the perpetrators to do the hacking and the locking of things down. Not saying the companies do that, but the skill set that does that is the same skill set whereby people are down in the dark web, they call it, uh, doing all these kinds of things. Um, another place where people should not get curious and meander into, by the way, is the thing called the dark web or the black web. Please do not go there because you will be compromised. Wow. Yeah, uh, that was my question. Um, she, my daughter did go through the steps to try to retrieve it and she <laughs> couldn't remember any of the answers mm -hmm. to the questions that she feels so so she could not get in but you think there is um a geek out there somewhere that could do that at her risk a, a geek to help uh, uh help her get into a file that or a location on the web that uh she's forgotten her password to yes That's a little different because now that's an external source. I mean, if see, in our world, if I can touch it, I can get in it. Mm -hmm. I can't touch that cloud server. Mm -hmm. But if you were talking about the uh, uh, password she forgot, uh, forgot on her laptop or uh, some file that's on the laptop or what have you, yes, that, that's fairly easy for us to get that if we can physically touch that device. That's fairly easy for us to do. Okay. But uh, we don't want to certainly uh, start trying to hack uh, some cloud. Uh, <laughs> and we do white, we're white hat hackers, not the black hat hackers. <laughs> we do it for good. I'll remember that, Mr. Spigner. <laughs> That's right. When I lock myself out. <laughs> That's right. Hey, let me just point out to everyone, for those of you that are watching this live, there is a survey in the chat room. This is the survey we actually want you to take uh, that uh, Mr. Spigner's posted in the chat room. So if you have a few moments, you can pull that up. There are also some uh, government links that are in the chat room that uh, one is from uh, NSA.gov. There are a couple of federal government links that provide some tips on being safer in this cyber environment that we're operating in. I see, uh, Terry, people are getting 100% scores, so somebody's got it right. <laughs> um, but folks, we've got about five minutes, so if any of our audience have questions, use your raise hand feature or just unmute and um, let's see if our panels, we're not trying to play stump the panelists, but with these experts, let me just tell you that when we send our summary notes out, we're gonna, we have had some phenomenal high quality information. We're gonna include their bios and we're gonna include the answers to the questions they provided this evening in our written summary and on YouTube. So uh, I saw some folks in the audience unmuted. If you have a question, you can go ahead and proceed. Anyone? I have a question. I'll go ahead and ask. Um, how do you prevent Zoom bombers? Zoom bombers. 
Okay, see, when that first happened, um, that is really a good question because Zoom is a corporation that makes a good virtual meeting product. And when you buy the actual product, all of the instructions and directions, how to set it up, it's a, so you can protect it and who gets in, who sees what, and who can take control and do things. Well, when that phenomena first started happening, it was this free Zoom that was kind of out there and people were just kind of setting up meetings. They didn't know about the controls. They didn't know how to set up the controls. So the answer to the question is know the product, know how to set up your controls and put those in place for meetings. And then that should protect you from what became this phenomena called Zoom bombing. And the CIO Gibson is absolutely right. Zoom has come up with uh, more security uh, credentials in their settings uh, of their application. Uh, so now you see a lot of folks who are requiring passwords in order to, to join a meeting. Uh, they're, you can set the meetings up so that folks have to, and they're forced to sit in a lobby before they are allowed to come in. Uh, so all those settings have been enhanced inside of Zoom to give you more granular uh, control over who is allowed into your meetings. Thank you very much. Excellent. Are there any other questions? Going once, going twice. Well, I got to insert mine in throughout the meeting, so I am good. Let me just thank Ms. Can I say one, one last yeah, thing? Yes, yes. yes, I was going to, I was just getting ready yeah. to say I wanted to give uh, each of well, you a minute right. to give closing remarks. So if you want to go first. Well, okay, I'll start then. Okay. Um, just remember, cyber awareness is very important. We put a link uh, in here for you to take a cyber awareness, uh, um, you know, um, exam. It's free. Um, but it allow you to understand more of what we were talking about and share it with others in your family so that they can also begin to be more cyber aware. I, I tell people all the time that whether you're in an office or whether you're at home, we have to figure out a way to make cybersecurity awareness and cybersecurity hygiene. We got to make it sexy. We got to make it something that you really want to get good at. You want to get so good at it that uh, you can identify a fake from 100 miles away. You can identify a fake as soon as it, it uh, falls into your email box. Um, so that's how you want to be because it takes, th they're going to try thousands and millions of times to get you. They only need you to fail one time mm -hmm. and you got it. This is about money. These cyber criminals don't do this just for fun. This is not a hobby. This is about them separating you from your money. And they feel no shame about it because they look at it as, if you're stupid enough to do this, then I'm going to take your money and not feel any shame. They do it to the elderly. They do it to the weak. They do it to those who are uninformed. And they do, they'll do it to anybody. There is no shame in their game. So you have to just make sure that your game is tight, remains tight, and you remain aware. Thank you, Senator Griffith. This has been a joy joining you and uh, your audience this evening. Senator, can I ask one more question? Uh, we have sure. we complete, okay. Um, does Microsoft, Amazon, Google, or the IRS um, call you for either com uh, computer financial problems well, do they require that you, I don't understand this. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read it. It says, does Microsoft, Amazon, Google, IRS call you for either computer financial problems or do they require you to purchase gift cards? That's how the question reads. It's a little Never. confusing. Never, they don't, they don't call you and, and they definitely don't tell you you need to be paying with a gift card. Never. Okay. And if you didn't originate the call, then you hang up and call back the actual company to find out what's going on. Thank you. Okay, let's get closing remarks from our other two panelists. Ladies, either one of you. Um, I, what I will say is trust your instincts and your common sense. And if it doesn't feel right, then don't do it. Don't click. Um, do your due diligence and your research to secure your homes and your phones. Um, I know we've been very scary tonight. We weren't any fun. 
Um, but you shouldn't no. walk away feeling like you shouldn't walk away feeling like you don't know what to do. You, 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 it's, it's the information is out there. Um, and you are able to take to secure the things that you need to secure. And at the end of the day, like those surveys, you don't have to participate if you don't want to, which won't invite those things into your, your space. And Senator, thank you so much. This, this has been a lot of fun for me. <laughs> um, but thank you again. It was a pleasure meeting you. Thank you. Fantastic. And we'll wrap up with Ms. Gibson. So thank you. Um, this has been fun because it's always interesting to have panel discussions with different perspectives um, because this cyber world we're in, it's going to continue to move forward. But I'm going to make this fun by saying, don't forget users, you're not cyborgs, okay? You're human beings and you're using these. These are tools to help you uh, do your daily life. So you don't want the tool to take control of you. We want you to be in control of your device, your digital experience, your digital health and a hygiene. Um, and we use that word because here again, we don't want the tool is supposed to be doing a good turn out to be a very detrimental thing for you. And so, but it is fun, uh, do your education, your learning. If you're gonna use these tools, it pays off. And um, here we are trying to basically merge both the business world and the work world. And that's why we offer all these tools and this knowledge in the workplace so that people can have the opportunity to have a lot of that learning. They can take those same skills uh, home with them. So also I wanna thank you, uh, Senator, for bringing this topic up because it is a very important part of our lives and we appreciate your consciousness and, and asking us to like join you. We're very happy to do so. And um, here again, thank you so much. And we appreciate the opportunity to work with you tonight. Well, thank you all so much and bravo to our audience. Thank you all for being here. And, you know, each time we have one of these Let's Talk sessions, we are each taking a step on our own behalf and we are our best allies. So the tools we've been provided with this evening, we should use them, we should share them. We've got some valuable information in the chat. We'll be in touch with all of you who've registered with the feedback in writing as promised. And you can visit us on the Senator Melanie Griffith YouTube channel, little shameless plug. And uh, we will be uh, announcing our next Let's Talk session very soon. We're looking at uh, workforce and entrepreneurship. So uh, we're gonna be working on that. We have a couple of exciting topics coming up in 2022. This is our December Let's Talk. So we'll be back in the new year. May God bless each of you. Have a very, very happy holiday season. Please stay safe. Please stay safe. Please stay safe. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.